beautiful shot of the Tokyo skyline where the Pan Pacific Championships are taking place and the U.S. is cleaning up after one day. Hello, everybody. You're watching Deck Pass Live. I'm Jeff Cummings with my wonderful co-host, Amy Van Dyken. So great to have you back. It's so good to be here. It's good to be back. We had so much fun at Nationals. We're going to go ahead and do it again. Yeah, so we're coming to you from the USA Swimming Headquarters in Colorado Springs, where a lot of the magic happens, a lot of, where a lot of these athletes get all their inspiration, a lot of the work that takes place to get these athletes to the Tokyo Pan Packs. Yeah, exactly. And what a lot of people don't know is that um, I trained here from 94 to 2000 and had a chance to swim with Jeff for a lot of those years. So we are kind of, I guess, if you will, back home. Yeah, it's a nice homecoming. A lot has changed since then, yes. but for the better, it's just really great to see USA Swimming continually to improve. Right. All right, so as I said, we're here at the USA Swimming Headquarters. We're going to be with you all four days of the Pan Pacific Championship, so always be sure to join us 1 p.m. Eastern on USAswimming.org. We're going to talk about all all the races from Tokyo. All right, so this was a really good night for a lot of the athletes to really test how they can improve from their swims at nationals. Okay. And one of those people, obviously one of the big stars of USA Swimming, Katie Ledecky. Yeah. She was in the first race of the night, one of the big stars, getting things kicked off in the women's 800 freestyle, getting ready there. And she was basically, as we know, going to be swimming against herself. And as always, we're on world record watch with Katie. She was there for about 400. And then here we are at the final 50, pretty much well ahead of the field here. And I love watching that underwater of Katie Ledecky because if you watch her, it looks like she's about ready to swim 100 meter freestyle. I mean, you, she's got that great dolphin kick, great, you know, beat her kick underneath the water and look at her stroke. It's that traditional kind of loping stroke, but it's so long and so powerful. I, that's why I love that shot. And she's a good 15 meters ahead of the rest of the field there. And again, she's not on one record pace, and this is a respectable time. 809.13 is her fifth fastest performance all time. A little, little nod of the head. She was happy with that. Look at this race for second. Ah. Ariane Titmus from Australia just beats out Leah Smith ah. for second. 817.07 to 817.21. It's a personal best for Leah by a hundredth of a second, so she'll take that, I'm sure. Yeah, she'll absolutely take that, and it was a really good swim for her, a great swim for Katie as well. But the question was, Katie didn't go as fast as maybe we expected her to. So I'm going to ask you, Jeff, was it because of the fact that she was so far ahead, or was it because there was another event for her to swim closer in the evening. Yeah, what do you the 200 think? freestyle. It's it's hard to say, but you know, I think you know, in the back of her mind, she probably knew she had the 200 free coming up. Yep. But she always puts in a good effort no matter what. And I think yeah. it's good preparation for her because you never know what meet may be coming up where right. you have to prepare for a tough double like that. Yeah, exactly. All right, so that 200 freestyle, she was back there in lane number four. And the 200 freestyle, she never has an easy time of it. And she had a big race with Canada's Taylor Ruck, who was, until a couple weeks ago, the fastest swimmer in the world with her 154 from Commonwealth Games. And final 50, Taylor's got this big lead with the key A from Japan out there in lane number two. And there's Katie closest to us. She's trying hard. Yeah, she is. I mean, look at her. She is sprinting. But you're talking about how this is a different race for her. I mean, she's used to the mile, the 800, the 400. This is a pure sprint for her, and it is really tough, as you can see. And she's really trying to catch Ruck in a PA, but she just runs out of room, and Ruck gets that win, 154-44. It's a good swim for her. And really, it's, it's not a bad swim for Katie, but it's just very unusual for us to see her in that bronze medal position. And I know then she's not real happy with that. And the 155, she could have been probably a, a full second faster. Let's look at that fourth place there. Allison Schmidt, 156.71. I'm sure everybody's just very happy to see that she can back up her swim from nationals yeah. and do very well. Well, right. yeah, and she's had, you know, a, she retired, mm -hmm. and then she had a very open conversation about her battle with depression and anxiety. And so she's really helping a lot of people. So it is really nice to see her do that. Yeah. All right, so let's hear what Katie had to say after her 200 freestyle. Uh, yeah, it was good. I wanted to get out there and see what I could do, push myself, and um, I'm happy with the time, and I know there's a lot of room for improvement in that race, and I'm looking forward to working towards those things over the next two years. All right, so yeah, a lot of room for improvement right. for her, obviously, if she wants to be back on the top of the medal stand, but uh, you know, that again, that double is very impressive to be able to get on the medal stand twice, right. and we want to mention also Leah Smith had that same kind of double, too. She was in the B final of the 200 free. Uh, it's very tough to be able to back up something like that, and really, I mean, it's 
Katie Ledecky is really the only person I think who can really do something like that. Right. And what a lot of people don't understand is the reason it's tough is not because it's an 800 and then a 200. They do more than that in any given warm up. The reason it's tough is because, A, you're racing. So you've got all this adrenaline. You get out of the pool, and then the drug testing, people come to you. You sign the paper. Then you have this person with you all night long. You've got to do interviews. You've got to get ready. You've got to go to the award stand. And then you've got to get prepared to go out and swim another race. Now, when you see Katie Ledecky there at the blocks at the 200, Jeff, what a lot of people don't know, we know, their drug tester, her drug tester, pardon me, was right behind her. So they don't leave her side or anyone's side for a long time. So yeah. can you imagine getting ready for a race with someone you don't know behind you? Yeah, that's you know? a little nerve wracking, I think. A little bit, but yeah. You just have to kind of put on the blinders and say, yeah, it's just me. It's just me out there. <laughs> and right. you know, it's just a, another quick thing about that 200 free. There probably wasn't a lot of time to warm down for Katie because, you know, you had to do, you had to get the drug testing thing. You probably had to talk to the coach real quick. You had to go to the awards for the 200 freestyle or the 800 freestyle beforehand. Yeah. So, you know, she probably had maybe time to do maybe a 200, which is not enough warm down no. from an 800 freestyle. So, no. you know, she was probably really feeling it in her legs and, um, you know, but still just take nothing away from that. It's still a stupendous well, effort. She's still got the 400 and she's still got that great mile that she's going to be doing later. So right. I think she's still going to have a great meet. She will. She's still Katie Ledecky. But the thing is, is that we saw in this 200, Jeff, she's actually a human being. Yeah. And well, my, a lot of people don't know that. I know, right? So we're telling you here. Yeah, she's a, a little outside. vulnerable, but she's still a great swimmer. That's one of the right. Best. That's right. All right. So let's talk about some of the other women's races that took place um, in the pool. The women's 100 breaststroke, Lily King, 105.44 to win. Right. A little slower than she did at nationals. Right. But it's still, you know, in, in this respect, a win's a win. Absolutely. And here's my thing with Lily King. And I love her. I've loved her since the Olympics uh, when she was wagging her finger back in the ready room. And I would really enjoy to see if she was back in the ready room doing that. Because she said to us at Nationals, Jeff, here on Deck Pass Live, that she kind of turns into a different person. And yeah. I can relate to that. They called me, you know, the assassin with a giggle. And that's kind of what you feel like. You're, you're a different person when you're getting ready yeah. to race. And I'm glad that she's so open about that. But I want to see that. Yeah. Finger I want to see what the beast mode looked like in the ready room for her. Exactly. It would, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be really fearful of Lila when she comes into there. Yeah, so I would too. And, and I was one of those that got angry like that. So, and I'd be afraid of her. All right. So we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we had a lot of fun talking about women's races. We're going to give the men their due, starting off with Chase Kalish getting ready there for the men's 400 IM. We'll talk about that race in a minute. At USA Swimming, we use technology to work with our athletes and improve performance. The underwater camera is a view that you would never get in any other setting. Most facilities that people train in don't have that capability to film directly underwater and pan, tilt, and zoom with them um, as they're swimming. Seeing the above water part is probably maybe 20% of what's really important, and then the other 80% is happening underwater. The views that it provides us um, from sort of a, a below angle allows our swimmers to see their stroke from a, a perspective they aren't able to see from our other video, um, a perspective their coaches aren't able to see from standing on deck. We even have some old coaches that um, feel like they're looking at the sport a whole new way now that they're looking at it from an underwater view. We kind of look for inconsistencies and inefficiencies. For most people, it would be things within their stroke where they lose good catch of the water or their body position gets out of an ideal line. What we're trying to do the most is actually see if they're moving water in the right direction. And they're trying to move forward, so you're trying to push water back towards your feet. So just trying to make sure that, that an athlete's arms are and hands and wrists and forearms are moved and angled in the right way. Having underwater video is probably the most valuable piece of information that we can have for an athlete and their technique and how they move through the water. A lovely shot of the Tatsumi International Swim Center in Tokyo where the Pan Pacific Championships are taking place. And we're back here for Deck Pass Live. Thanks everybody for joining us again. Jeff Cummings with Amy Van Dyken. And before we talk about the men's races, Amy, I think we should talk a little bit about what the Pan Pacific Championships are because it's a very unique meet. The world is not swimming in one meet together this year. It's a very unique time. Right now, actually, the European Championships are taking place. And the Pan Pacific Championships was actually created as a response to the European 
European championships because the Europeans had their meat, but the Asians and the people in the Americas didn't have a meat. So Japan, Australia, Canada, and the United States all got together and said, why don't we create a meat for ourselves? And in 1985, First Pan Pacific Championships was born, and it's become a very exciting meet ever since then. And you were a part of Pan Pacific Championships. I mean, it's yeah. and it's always very exciting to get that rivalry because yeah. Australia, Canada, Japan, they're all very good, very good nations. Yeah, they truly are. And some, in a lot of cases, these are the people that you're going to be seeing at World Championships and at the Olympics competing against you. So it really is fun. It's really, really exciting. So the Pan Pacific Championships are absolutely huge for United States swimming. So yeah. it's nice that we're doing well. And it's really big this year. We kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Is it's qualifying for the World Championships for next year? Right. You know, remember the times from nationals in the A final and the times from the A and B finals will determine who gets on the net on the World Championship team next year. I do not envy Lindsay Bentinko because she's got a big job to do of taking all those times and looking at it. And it's really good because it's not saying, oh well, you weren't doing so well at nationals, and oh I know you had a little bit of off swim at Pan Packs, and we know you could do better at World, so we're going to put you on the World team no matter what. Right. Times only. So we may see some swims that you know some people that just don't get on that World Championship team that you're thinking, wow, it's a surprise they're not on it. It's times only. We're going to be talking a lot about that yeah. with a couple races coming up. Yeah, and it really is interesting, and it's been definitely a conversation between United States Swimming and of course the swimmers. It's a different way to do it. We'll see how it works. Yeah. All right, so men's 400 IM was one of the hot yeah. topics of the meet for the first day because we had a great rivalry set up with Chase Kalis, the reigning world champion. You see him right there. And he was going to be flanked by two swimmers from Japan, Diaceto and Hagino, and Kosuke Hagino. They flipped first after the backstroke, and Chase was a full body length behind on breaststroke. But as those Japanese swimmers knew, once Chase got into breaststroke, he was going to go right by them, and he did. And look at the lead he had going into the final 25 of freestyle. And he looks really good good, really strong. He's got a great kick behind him, nice high elbows. Again, he has that loping stroke, but it's really effective for him. And look at that lead, Jeff. That's a bigger lead than I thought he would have at the end of this race. And the time even wasn't what I thought he would. It was only about three tenths faster than he went at Nationals. And Jeff, you and I were talking at Nationals at On Deck Pass Live about how we really thought that we would see Chase swim faster here at the Pan Pacifics because he would have more rest. Um, so it is kind of interesting that he didn't do as well as we thought. But again, he was so far ahead. Did he back down? You never know. Yeah, and even the times from Hagino and Seto weren't as fast as we thought they would be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe everybody's just thinking about not just next year's World Championships, but the Tokyo Olympics. They're trying to just say, okay, this is going to be a year of building and building and building, and times aren't really important. Right. And also, we got to keep in mind that the Japanese also do have the Asian Games coming up a little bit later, so maybe they're all peaking for that. Um, but it's just, it's okay. It's still yeah. you know, a win's a win. Absolutely. Chase is going to World Championships. He's going to defend his title. I'm sure the Japanese, when they have their trials, they're going to be back fighting him. So let's hear what Chase had to say after that exciting 400 IM. Yeah, I, I mean, the Japanese are definitely way stronger than me on the front half. So um, I just got to keep my composure through the 200 and really play to my strengths. And I, I think I did a good job of that there. Yeah, he did a he pretty did. good job. And it, it's so hard for Chase, I'm sure, to know that those guys are really strong on the front half to be patient yeah. and make sure that you do not waste all of your energy for that back half, which he knows is his strongest. Right. And as we're talking about these times aren't great, at least these athletes are getting a chance to race. And that's really what's important here because we do have world championships coming up next year. Then we've got the Olympics and racing is really important. You can't really simulate that in a pool as hard as you try in practice. You've right. got to get out there and really right. do it. All right, so we're talking about racing. One of the yep. biggest exciting races of the night was a men's 200 freestyle. It was going to come down to the final stroke. The two Americans, uh, we had Andrew Seliscar and Townley Haas there in lanes four and five. As we saw at Nationals a couple weeks ago, Townley was out fast with the 150C underwater dolphin. Where is he? There he is, Andrew Seliscar. Pops up ahead with a, with 25 meters to go. It looked like Andrew was just going to win this race, but Townley wasn't getting away from him. No, not at all. And you know, Andrew Seliscar is coming off an amazing college season going into this season right here. So he's been doing a lot of racing like we've been talking about in the college season, which helps him right here at the end of this race. But Townley gets his hand on the wall first just by a, a tenth of a couple tenths of a second. There he is, 145.56 to 145.74. So Townley's faster and he's slamming nationals. Andrew right on his time for nationals, which was very good for him. So we were talking about how this meet is a selection process for Worlds. This race really was one of those races where it determined how important it is to be able to get the 
the opportunity that second chance meet at Pan Pax because Townley was third in the 200 freestyle at nationals. Right. Which, if you just took time for nationals to determine world championships, Townley would be unable to swim the 200 free right. at world championships. But because they take time from Pan Pacific championships, all Townley had to do was swim faster than 145.93 to get his spot in the 200 free at world championships. He did that and more, got a gold medal. And so now he's going to get a chance to be back in that 200 freestyle. Unfortunately, that means the guy who got second at nationals, Blake Peroni, he's only going to be able to swim a relay at the world championships, which, you know, that's a really still a really big deal. It's a huge deal. But then again, this goes back to this is why there is so much conversation about the way that we're picking the teams, because, you know, Peroni's like, for all intents and purposes, wait a minute, I got second at nationals. I should be the guy, you know, to do this. And, and he's not. But I think that this is a cool way to do it. I think it's very interesting. I love Lindsay for doing this. Again, we're having a national team director who is actually an athlete. So she kind of knows what it's like and how much pressure it is at that at the games trials or at world championship yeah. trials to get first or second. You can have someone that just has an amazing day and gets first or second, and then you go to the meet and well, where they go and you want yeah. your top swimmer there. That's great. Yeah. And, and I really, I think everybody knew the rule. Everybody knew what it was going to take and they put their best swims forward in, in Tokyo and Townley got just the door was open yeah. for him and he stepped right through it. Yep, which is really, really cool. And that's what you uh, need to do at these big meets. Yeah, all right. So we're going to, this was really big drama for the men's 1500 freestyle, yes. not just for the medals, but determining who was going to go to world championships in the United States. And we had Jordan Wilimovsky as the big favorite. Robert Fink also representing the United States. Now, this was a timed final. So in the earlier heats, Zane Grothy from the United States from a 14.48.40, a lifetime best by 12 seconds. Jordan and Robert knew this. Uh -huh. And so they're swimming not just to, to get medals, but to be able to get first or second times so that they can go world championships. So here we see Jordan in the lead there, Robert Fink giving chase. And so I think Rob, Jordan probably knows that he's going to go faster in 14.48, but you never really know, and that's why you're putting forth your best effort. Jordan gets the gold medal, 14.46.93. Jordan looks, yeah, he's like, whew, thank God. And look at that time for Robert Fink. 14.48.70 by three tenths of a second. Zane Grothy beats him, gets on that world championship team. So let's take a look at that, right? And let's discuss this right now because sure. we, for all intents and purposes, should have gotten first, second, and third in the men's 1500. But we only got first and second. So right. you're the swimming nerd. Let's let you explain it, Jeff. <laughs> all right, so... Everybody knows with, with FINA, there, you have a two athlete per country rule. Okay. So for this kind of meet, they basically said only two athletes can get in the top three on the medal stand. So unlike back in the 70s when the United States used to get first, second, and third at the Olympics right. and everything, only two athletes can represent each country basically in the top eight. So yes, the Americans got one, two, and three in the 1500 freestyle, but and another bad moment for Robert Fink, he not only gets bumped off the world championship team, he gets bumped off the medal podium because two other Americans were faster than him. But that's good news for Jack McLaughlin for, uh, from Australia, because yeah. he was fourth, but he gets bumped up and gets a bronze medal for his efforts. So, yay, I think Jack was happy, Robert not so happy, but you know, this is good news for Robert because he's really been building up, and it was a massive best time for him. Right. I think it was actually like a seven second best time for him. So wow. he's gotta be happy about that. And he'll get to swim, I think, probably in the, um, either the World University Games or the Pan American Games. So he'll get an international meet. Right. So I think that he, he knows that. And, of course, he'll be looking to say, well, I'm going to get in that ultimate international <laughs> team in the Olympics in 2020. And by the way, kids, when you are in a time final, don't get upset that you're not in the final heat because look what just happened. Yeah. Someone from a heat before actually ended up getting on the medal podium. So a race is a race, kiddos. A race is a race. All right, so let's hear from the gold medalist, Jordan Wilimowski. Yeah, you know, I was just excited to race. Um, we got here Sunday night, and I've just been getting getting ready for the 1500. Looking forward to it. Um, time was a little off from what I wanted to go. I think I just went out like a little hard, a little rushed on the rate, um, spun a little bit. But uh, you know, always always happy to just try and get on the medal podium for us. So 
That was good. <laughs> so Jordan is, you know, he was talking about how he just went out a little bit too hard, but mm -hmm. it's a learning process. And, you know, you just take away what you could do for the next time. And, yeah. you know, it's really exciting for Jordan because he's one of those people who has been doing very well in open water the past couple of years. He was the open water world champion in the 10K in Kazan in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then he was in the Olympic final of the 1500 in Rio and um, in the 10K in Rio. So he's been one of those people who's been doing very well in the pool and open water. He's going to be swimming in the open water 10K at Pan Pax on Tuesday. So he could be a double gold medalist. I mean, he, that's going to be really exciting. He could, and I think that he absolutely will. And, you know, what I love, though, is when we do these interviews with these swimmers, notice one thing. Katie Ledecky, Wilmoski, very stoic, distance swimmers, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to see some interviews with some other people who may be sprinters, and they're, like, so animated. But I wonder if it's just because the distance swimmers are so tired. They're, yeah, it, yeah, it takes a lot more out of them to do a distance race. Yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll go with that yeah. one. <laughs> and they probably don't, they need a little more warm downtime. Sure, yeah. 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 They spend a lot of time alone as well. So, <laughs> you know, a little bit more than the sprinters. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about one other race that happened for the men. It was the men's 100 breaststroke. Unfortunately, the Americans did not get on the medal podium, Amy. It was a very exciting race. Yasuhiro Koseki from Japan defended his Pan Pacific Championship title with 5908. Jake Packard, Australia, and Jao Gomez from Brazil rounded out the podium. The Americans, Andrew Wilson and Michael Andrew, were fifth and seventh, respectively. Andrew, a little bit just a teeny bit slower in East Women Nationals. Michael was about six tenths slower. Okay. So that really made the difference in getting on that medal podium. Okay. Um, but those two will be going to world championships in the 100 breaststroke. So I'm sure Michael will be excited for that. And for Andrew, it's both of them is their first time on world championship team. So a lot of international experience for both of them in that 200 bre in that 100 breast. Okay. Andrew's going to be swimming the 200 breast a little bit later. Uh, for Michael, he's going to be doing the 100 fly, 100 back, and 50 free. So he's not done yet. Okay. We're going to be seeing a lot more from him. Yeah, he said that he wanted to be the fastest in all of the 50s and so he's really working towards that and uh, we'll see how he how he does he's always a fast swimmer and an exciting swimmer yeah so we talked about how Andrew and Michael are first timers on their big first senior in level international team and you know it's really exciting as we've talked about that cap with your name on it to yes. get that and we're gonna see a little bit of the process it takes to get all that gear for a national team athlete At USA Swimming, we use technology to work with our athletes and improve performance. The underwater camera is a view that you would never get in any other setting. Most facilities that people train in don't have that capability to film directly underwater and pan, tilt, and zoom with them um, as they're swimming. Seeing the above water part is probably maybe 20% of what's really important, and then the other 80% is happening underwater. The views that it provides us um, from sort of a, a below angle allows our swimmers to see their stroke from a, a perspective they aren't able to see from our other video, um, a perspective their coaches aren't able to see from standing on deck. We even have some old coaches that um, feel like they're looking at the sport a whole new way now that they're looking at it from an underwater view. We kind of look for inconsistencies and inefficiencies. For most people, it would be things within their stroke where they lose good catch of the water or their body position gets out of an ideal line. What we're trying to do the most is actually see if they're moving water in the right direction. And they're trying to move forward, so you're trying to push water back towards your feet. So just trying to make sure that, that an athlete's arms are and hands and wrists and forearms are moved and angled in the right way. Having underwater video is probably the most valuable piece of information that we can have for an athlete and their technique and how they move through the water. to Deck Pass Live. So as we talked about, it's a great feeling to be a part of the USA Swimming National Team. Not only do you get to represent the United States in the pool, but you know, one of the things that I liked about it was to travel to places you probably would yeah. never go on your own. Right. Um, and to meet friends that you'll have for life. Yep. But it's also the swag. Of course it's the, the swag. The free swag that you get from USA Swimming is unbelievable. I always, I think when I was done with my swimming career, I looked at all the clothes that I had. I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I could ever wear all of this stuff in my lifetime. It was so much stuff. And you never really know it in the moment. Right. But when you're on multiple teams, you you get so much stuff. And it's just so great to be able to look at this stuff. And you kind of look back and say, yeah, I got to represent the United States. And, yeah. And it's just such a cool feeling. And I know you probably feel that too. Oh, it's, yeah. and, and even from like, you know, you went to the Olympics mm -hmm. twice, and I mean, the swag for that. 
I can't even, Jeff. So here's the deal, right? You go through United States swimming, but then you go to a warehouse and they give you grocery carts. And you're putting stuff, Cabbage Patch dolls, water bottles, Barbies, let me get a hat, let me get a jacket. And I mean, it is out of control. And actually, at the end, they have big, huge boxes, so you can send it all back home because it is so much stuff. Oh, my gosh. Okay, if you yeah. needed another reason to make the Olympic team, I think she just gave it there to you. There it is. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look behind the scenes of what it took to get these athletes geared up for the Pan Pacific Championships. We do our best to have our team comfortable and stress-free the entire time that they're traveling. So a lot of what we do on the front end and in those team processing moments are to relieve stress from them. So if we can get their uniforms taken care of for them, their equipment, any kind of thing they would need traveling. So that comes down to backpacks or hand sanitizer, whatever it is to make their life easier in preparation for these big competitions, we try and do that ahead of time. Our shipping and receiving division here at USA Swimming is busy pretty much from the day we start planning a team to the day the team leaves and and we're here all day long just getting stuff set and taken care of so we want our athletes to be comfortable at all times so that the stress is taken away from them and when they're in a stress-free environment it allows them to be competing at their best level and we want to compete at the best level every time we can uh, we want to be number one in the world and that's what we want to keep doing All right, just a wonderful behind the scenes look because a lot of people I think watching the show don't really know what it takes to get all this stuff going. It takes a lot of work for a lot of people. And also, one thing that you need to pay attention to at the Pan Pacific Championships and everywhere is that a team captain will decide what everyone is wearing for that day. So you don't even have to think about your outfit, girls. It's a good thing. Also, watch prelims and finals. You'll notice something that in the prelims, everyone will wear a white cap. And at finals, everyone will wear a black cap. And that has happened since before I think the earth had cooled and even before I was born. So um, they will continue to do that. And it really is neat. You don't have to think about a thing. Yeah, it's really crazy. All you have to do is just step up on the blocks and go when the beep goes. That's yeah, which really cool. should be easy, yeah, you'd yeah. think. You'd think, yes. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. I hope so. <laughs> By this point, if you made an international team, I think that's the least of your worries. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and here's the thing, too, is that when we're looking at all of this and what they're doing, we really had a short amount of time for not only these people who are putting together all of this equipment for the athletes, but for the athletes yeah. themselves, Jeff. I mean, it really, what is it, two weeks? It and less than two weeks. Less than two weeks. They've got to come together as a team and get ready to go. Yeah, it's, it was one of the shortest turnarounds that I think they, they, they've ever had. Yeah. And I know a lot of the athletes were a little worried about that. I talked to a few of them in Irvine and said, yeah, it's worry. I'm worried because this was a full taper for me, and now I've got to either hold my taper or go up in yards and get ready for another taper. They weren't really sure what they were going to do. Um, and, yeah, it's not much time. And it's not much time for the team to jump. Gel. You know, they, they, we've always heard from the, the 2012 Olympic team and the 2016 Olympic team how they were such a close team, but they had like three weeks of training camp. And so that's plenty of time to gel as a team and really kind of get that, that unity that you need. That, you know, it's great that they kind of got the team right away and they went to training camp right away, but it's just such a short turnaround and I know there's really not much that they can do about that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are really, they plan that. And you know, we've seen some of the, the athletes really being able to capitalize on that and swim faster right. at Pan Packs and it's been tough for some of them. But you know, it, it is what it is and I think a lot of them are really understanding that. And um, you know, it's just another piece of just being able to make the best out of whatever situation is handed to you. No, exactly, and I will say, as a sprinter, this quick turnaround is easier for sprinters because you can continue your taper and not really have to build up, whereas these distance swimmers, it is really yeah. tough for them. So keep an eye on that as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, so day two in the pool of Pan Pacific Championships. Look at that schedule. This is going to be another exciting one. 100 free, 200 fly, 100 back, 800 free relay. You know, Amy, I think the race that I'm really excited for is that women's 100 backstroke. We're going to have Kathleen Baker, who broke the world record here, as you see, in Irvine just two weeks ago. It just, I just love watching this. Head Go. just throw it to the wall, 58 flat, and just her reaction less than two seconds later, knowing she got that record. And I'm just excited to see her match up with the former world record holder, Canada's Kylie Moss, because yeah. I know that, Ka that Kylie wants that world record back, and both of them want to be set to say, I'm the first to win under 58 seconds. Oh my gosh, can you imagine that? We may see that tomorrow. 
the race that I'm excited for, yeah. and of course I am a little biased, is the women's 100 meter freestyle. And there is a great reason for that. Yeah. We've got Campbell and we've got our own Simone Manuel, who you know is my woman crush Wednesday <laughs> every single day of the week. And I really think that these two ladies going to head to head, they're going to push each other to some times that I don't know. Are we going to see a world record? I think it is very, very possible. That's the race I'm looking forward to. So we may see it tomorrow. Cross we, your fingers. We may see it. And just for, if, for those you may not have known, there was a 400 mixed medley relay swim today. And on the anchor leg for go, for the Australians, Kate Campbell went 50.93. I am not misspeaking. Five zero decimal point nine three. 95% of the males in this world would love to be able to do that. I was going to say, back in the day, Jeff would have loved to have gone that in the 50. I, yeah, you're probably right. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe I'm in the kidding. 50. I'm kidding. But, you know, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. So we'll see if she can back that up in her own individual swim tomorrow. She yeah. won't be able to go 50.9 because she had a relay start. Right. But, you know, this, everybody's thinking now. Are we think, going to see a 51? Right, you never know. You and never these know. two girls, they're probably going to be able to do that. But you know, remember that Campbell is always a little bit better on the relay. There are swimmers who are like that, and then they get to the individual and maybe not as strong. Um, but again, these two women are some of the best sprinters that we have seen around in a long time. So yep. keep your eyes peeled, keep people. Keep your eyes peeled. And, and just a lot of other great races to mm -hmm. watch. And we're going to be watching with everybody. Be sure to watch them all on the Olympic Channel. And then come to us again, 1 p.m. Eastern on USAswimming.org and we're going to recap it all for you. So for Amy Van Dyken and everyone here at USA Swimming, thanks for watching, and we will see you tomorrow.